Hello ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. This little video is of a demonstration of glass blowing by a charming young lady at Pilkington's Glass Museum and Art Gallery in St Helens on Merseyside which otherwise we older people know as the um, occupied territories of Lancashire and I hope you enjoy it. And this, which is this big white box here in the centre, this houses clear molten glass. So what we do is add different thin skins, highly concentrated coloured glass to the clear to create all the different effects. Now to start me off, I need my blowing irons, that's like preheating over here. This is just a hollow stainless steel tube that I can breathe down into the glass. And I've started out by preheating the business end of the metal. It's only when the metal is glowing this sort of dull orange colour, the metal's hot enough for the glass to stick to. Now to actually get the glass out of the furnace, inside the furnace actually a big ceramic pot. We have a couple in our studio floor just down this far side. So what we do is dip the iron into that pot and turn, and as we turn the glass sticks to the end, we can take what we call a gather of glass. So I'll do that now. Get my first gather of clear molten glass. So always good. Now the first thing I do with this particular bit of glass is start adding the colour 
powder glass. So that's what these different powders are here on the metal table. These are highly concentrated crushed up coloured glass. Now while the melting's colour in, I'll just explain a little bit about where clear molten glass actually comes from. Now believe it or not, clear molten glass is actually just sand. So what we do is we put white silica sand in the furnace, turn the furnace to 1300 degrees C, that melts the sand down and turns it into clear molten glass. But at that temperature, the glass is then too watery for us to work with. So we fetch the temperature down to about 1100. That way it's got a better consistency to it. So it's sort of like sticky toffee or really honey, that sort of consistency. Now the way in which we make all the different coloured glasses that we use, we don't do it ourselves. You need a different furnace for each individual colour. So we would do it ourselves, to be quite honest, but I'm entirely full studio and I need to be a gas bill that we've already got. So we buy the colours in. That way it makes it a little bit more economical to do hand blown glass. Now we buy them from a couple of different companies that are based overseas. There's one based in Germany, they're called Kubler. And there's another one based in New Zealand and they're called Gaffer. And they make the colours for us in all these different concentrated forms. Now what they do is they start off with clear molten glass like we have in our furnace, but they have different metals and minerals to the glass to make the different colours. So for instance, a blue glass tends to have a little bit of cobalt in it. Green glass has very amounts of iron or copper. Black glass has magnesium. Purple glass has manganese or cadmium. Uh, yellow glass has cadmium, sorry. Now, red glass, such as ruby or cranberry glass, it tends to be quite an expensive colour to use because it has a little bit of gold oxide added to the mixture. So that's why it tends to be a little bit more expensive to use than other coloured colour glasses. Or at least that's the theory anyway. Now, when we buy these colours in, we buy them in lots of different forms. Anything from solid bars of coloured glass, with every chip, chunk and grain, right down to very fine powders. So depending on what effect it is that we're going for, depends what size chip, chunk or grain we might use. Now I've used this powder granule in particular because this helps to create a nice even coating of colour across the top surface. Now that I've got enough colour across the top surface, I've got sort of a balance of temperatures and an imbalance of temperatures. So I had to cool the core down quite considerably to support this second layer of clear molten glass. When I'm in the reheating chamber behind me, the glass is heating from the outside in which is the complete opposite of what I want. I want the core nice and hot and the outside nice and cold. So we've got the complete opposite way around. So I need to control those temperatures. So I'm using that reheating chamber to top up the heat, using a couple of different tools then afterwards to cool the outside surface. And you repeat this process until you build up enough heat into the core. Now, to cool the outside surface down, that might seem quite strange because in the emphasis I get the whole thing nice and hot and then appear to be cooling it back down again. But if I don't cool the outside surface and I just try and blow down the iron, the piece will actually just pop like a balloon. So it needs that cold skin of glass to control where the air travels to. Now there's a couple of different tools that I can use to cool the outside. One is the metal table at the front, the marva. Now a lot of the tools and techniques we actually use were developed by the Romans, including that metal table at the front. But what the Romans would have used instead of the metal is a slab of highly polished marble. So the word marble, the name of this metal table, is an old French word for marble. Now the word has stuck over the centuries, but we now use stainless steel simply because it's a lot cheaper to get hold of. It's a little more practical inside the studio. So the technique of using that metal table we call marble in the glass. Now another tool that I can use is this pad. Now, I said before, to about a thousand degree bit of glass, hotter than an erupting volcano. This pad, believe it or not, it's actually just four sheets of newspaper folded into a square. Now, technically speaking, you could use six or seven sheets of newspaper, but at the moment we use the telegraph, so since it's slightly bigger, you can get away with a few less. Now, the actual make of the newspaper really doesn't matter. What happens with that is we fold it into a square and we leave it in a bucket of water for about ten minutes. The paper then soaks up all that water. So as the glass touches the top surface, it burns and chars, and it forms a carbon. Now it's a combination of that carbon and a layer of steam that's formed that helps to mould and shape the glass and control the temperature. 
Now because we keep that pad nice and wet, that helps build up that layer of carbon. So when we touch the surface of the glass, we can feel the weight and the shape, but we can't feel the heat at all, it doesn't transfer. I must admit, however, the first time I actually using that in university was like the scariest thing that ever existed. Someone to put your hand in a few sheets of paper and then nail out on glass. It's definitely it was quite a scary concept. Now, I've built up the heat into that core. I've also remember got that little bit of air in there and I've got that skin of coloured glass on the outside. Next I'm going to create the pattern. Now the pattern for this particular piece is what comes in two stages. So I've got that colour built up as a two-tonal effect, made from orange to yellow. Next stage is I'm going to give it a crackle or a crazed effect across the outside surface. So I'm going to get the whole of the molten glass nice and hot, right up to the top of the working temperatures. Then I'm going to bring this across the front of the studio and on the studio floor there's a little bucket of cold water. Now I'm going to plunge the molten glass into that cold water. That's going to crack and create a surface of the glass. But remember I built up that heat inside inside the glass. So now when I blow down the iron, that starts to separate the cracks and if I go back into the heat, that actually leaves me with the pattern but not the texture. So I've now got that cracked, sort of crazed effect across the top surface. And because glass has a surface tension to it, as it heats up, those cracks are going to shrink back and emphasise the crack crackled effect more than it did before. So, heating this through now. And before I blow this out too far, I do know I need to think about how I actually want to take this piece off the blowing iron. Now, we know that glass always likes to break at its weakest point. So now I'm going to use that fact to my advantage and create my own little fault line or score line in the top of the glass. So I can actually control where this comes off the iron at a later stage. So the tool I'm going to use next are called jacks or a pair of jacks. They're one of the most used tools in all the glass blowing, used for lots of different techniques. This is one of their main jobs. We actually call this line the jack line using this tool. Now the way this tool works is the top of the jacks, the curve, is actually a spring. So what I'm actually doing is working against that spring that then squeezes in the blade and then creates that initial score line for me. We always compare this line against a Kit Kat. You think of the fingers on a Kit Kat and the groove that runs in between each finger. It's that same groove that I'm putting on this piece of glass. to the score line, the knee to the tear. It's the same theory with this piece. Now with pretty much every piece we make, we always try and start off with a round ball of glass. That way we know a certain size ball will open out into a certain size dish or plate or vase, get whatever we're making for the day. Now I mentioned earlier the vase I'm making, it's got a sort of teardrop shape to it, it's also going to be flattened as well. So first things first, the teardrop shape. So now I'm going to go into the reheating chamber and concentrate the heat on the bottom sort of half or two thirds, almost up to that jack line, that score line. And when I come out, I'm going to use natural forces to help shape the glass. By using natural forces, you get a longer working time and a much more natural, even looking object. So concentrating the heat on the bottom half, when I come out, I'm going to angle the blowing iron downwards. That's going to allow gravity to pull and stretch on the glass. But there's a couple of different factors I have to think about at this point. Now one very important one being is if any part of the glass during the making process drops below the annealing point, which for this particular glass is 510 degrees C, if any part of it drops below that temperature, the glass starts suffering thermal shock and the whole thing can crack and explode off the end of the iron. So occasionally I have to push the whole thing to the back which there's no heat being lost in the top section. Now I'm just also using a pendulum motion here. So that's using centrifugal force, so going with a natural force to 
help elongate the shape for me without me having to do too much to the actual surface of the glass. Now we're going to go back into the reheating chamber. We're going to top up the heat in that top section. And I just need to tie up the shape a little bit. Still come up at the end of the making 
process. It just needs to provide enough surface contact. So, there's that little ring crown on the end. And I can stick this to the base. Now that I'm happy, everything's where it should be. I come back to that jack line. That score line that I made at the beginning. Use a combination of the cold steel of the jacks, use a wet file, and find a lot of thermal shock just around that rim. So when I strike the blowing iron, vibrations go down the blowing iron to that line and crack the glass off for me. Now, to do all that, seems really straightforward, but you do have to let the body of the glass get quite cold. And like I said before, if any part of this glass during the making process drops below that annealing point, that 510 degrees C, the whole thing will just crack and explode off the end of the iron. But I still needed the glass to be cold enough and brittle enough to come away from the blowing iron. So it had to be quite a crucial temperature. Around that sort of 550 degrees C, to be able to do that particular bit. But now it's at that temperature, it's on the punty. I turn the whole thing around which exposes a small hole. Now it's this hole, as you're beginning, to blow the piece up. I'm now going to use that hole and stretch that to form the rim of the bars. But at the moment that hole is quite small, so that means it's very difficult for the heat to get both the inside and outside walls of the glass. So I just need to take a couple of seconds to get the whole thing moving, and I can widen that hole out bit by bit. Now, to widen the hole out, again, I use the jacks. Now, I mentioned earlier, the top of the jacks, the curve, is a spring. Previously, I worked against that spring. This time, what I'm going to do is place the blades of the jacks on the inside of this small hole and slowly let that spring go out a bit at a time. Now, at the same time, I'm turning the iron with my left hand. That helps widen that hole out nice and evenly for me. We often say glass blow is kind of like patting your head and rubbing your tummy. One hand's doing one thing, it's completely different. The exact same time. This bit's no different, really. So just widen that out bit by bit. Now, obviously, I've been turning a lot through this process. That helps keep the glass on centre. But the way I've designed these pieces, the flat floor, and then turning the iron and open that hole out, it's rounded it off. So I need to make that hole, that opening, follow the profile of the glass. So this time, I'm going to use a bit of an unconventional tool. I'm going to give the whole thing a quick burst of heat. Again, focusing on that top section. And when I come back to the bench, I'm actually going to use a piece of copper pipe to actually help me to create the form of the glass and create the form of the opening. Because of its rounded size, it means it's not going to create any harsh edges on the glass, but it allows me to have contact with the glass for long enough before it heats up to be able to change the profile of the glass. So it just helps me manipulate the surface of it. Now the way I'm actually managing to focus the heat on particular parts of the glass is I'm using the fact that the doorway is lined with something called ceramic fibre. Now, this fact is a relatively modern invention compared to the rest of the equipment. It was actually developed in the late 60s by NASA to help insulate their space shuttles. But apparently, they couldn't actually get to work where they needed to for. But we find it very handy because what it actually does is reflects the heat back inside the chamber, which helps keep it up to 1,200 degrees C. It's our hottest piece of equipment in the studio. Now because the doors are lined with that fibre, it creates a brilliant cut-off point for us to focus the heat on particular parts of the glass. There we go. Now, give the whole thing a little burst of heat, I'm going to get what we call a flash of heat. So that means putting the whole thing in for no longer than about five seconds that helps even out the temperatures in the glass. Now the heat does mask the colour of the glass. So at the moment it looks like it's going to be orange and brown. When this piece actually comes out of the kiln, it will be that bright yellow and bright orange. At the moment it's just the heat that's masking the colours in it. Now last little bit, I'm going to take it off this iron and put it away in our kiln and decide to cool down nice and slow. So to take it off this iron, I need a few little sharp taps with a little fix, a bread knife, and this should take that punty away. So I just tap lightly where that punty meets the base. Then send the vibrations down the iron, and that separates the two pieces. Now that leaves what we call a punty mark or a punty scar. We always like to leave signs of the 
20's been there, so you know it's hand blown glass, because there's not a lot around these days. But it does tend to be a little bit sharp. So I'm just going to use this blowtorch to round any sharp edges off. Now this piece now is going to go away in our kiln at the side to cool down nice and slow. So for me to be able to place this in the kiln, and I need to wear a pair of Kevlar gloves, that's for the uh, protective wear that I'm wearing. It's made out of Kevlar, and it's allowed me to pick up this 600 degree bit of glass, and then place it in the kiln. Now that piece stays in there now for about 12 hours, because what happens to the glass at this point, all the different thicknesses to it have all different temperatures. The inside of the glass is pulling at the outside of the glass. So if we left that piece out in the open, for long about two or three minutes, it actually pull itself apart and explode, again due to that thermal shock. You've probably heard little bits in the bins at the back breaking out the blowing irons. That's because they haven't been cooled down properly. So everything that we make during the course of the day goes away in our kilns in our studio. Then at the end of the day, each kiln has a little computer on the side of it. We set that computer off. That cools everything down really slowly. It gives you about 12 to 18 hours. So the next day we come back in, all back to room temperature again. We can take them out, check for the quality, we sign them as well, and then we pretty much put them on our shelves. I suppose that's all there is to it, really. <laughs> I hope if anyone's got any questions, do feel free to come and ask. I'll do my very best to answer them. Everything you see on the displays in here, we've got a piece out in the gallery and up in the mezzanine, we have made ourselves in the studio. Now, it is all for sale, but in particular, the demonstration piece you see on display in our studio at a discounted rate just museum visitors. The maximum price you'll pay in this studio is just £25. And there are items that are much less than that as well. So if you'd like to take something away with you, you're more than welcome. We also do various classes, various taste sessions. We do half days, full days, one-to-one -one sessions, group sessions. Um, we have to do absolutely all sorts. So if you'd like to take yourself.